So here's where we were. We're looking at sequence to sequence models. And the uh, problem is uh, one where some sequence of input goes in and a different sequence of symbols comes out. And there may be no obvious correspondence between the sequence going in and the sequence coming out. For example, uh, if you were trying to perform say, a dialogue system. My screen is blank, goes in. Please check if your computer is plugged in, comes out. There's no real apparent correspondence between any component of the input any and any component of the output, neither in terms of order nor in terms of the actual symbols. So in this case, we saw that the kind of model that's most useful is the one shown here. Yeah. So, they can't hear me? Can I thought the mic is on. Wait, this is on. So, folks on Zoom, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, they're able to hear me. All right. So, and we saw that the kind of model that is most appropriate is this one here, uh, except, and so it has a component uh, of the model that processes the input and computes a hidden representation from the input, and a second component that uses this hidden representation to generate the response. Now, this basic model, of course, had the issue that uh, the uh, conveyance of information from one time step in the output to the other was entirely through the hidden representation, which we deemed was insufficient because the surface responses that are drawn at each time must also condition what comes downstream. And so the way we did it was to actually have those surface responses go back in. Now, something that you need to be uh, aware of over here is that in principle, in a model like this, the hidden states, the sequence of hidden states carry all the information required for the conceptual level of the response. The fact that the surface response is being fed back in has more to do with expression, but only in this model. We're gonna get uh, more uh, sophisticated pretty quickly, right? And so here's, here's how this so-called simple translation model worked. The input sequence fed into a recurrent structure and eventually when the last symbol of the input went in, you got some hidden state. This was the first component of the model. This is your encoder. And the hidden state was then passed to the decoder over here, which is the second recurrent network, which is seeded by a startup, startup sequence marker here, SOS. And this subsequently proceeds to generate a sequence of outputs. And each output is fed back as input to ensure consistency. And this generation stops when an end of sequence marker is finally produced. So the encoder was the portion of the model that processed the input to generate a hidden representation. And the decoder was the portion of the model that used this hidden representation to generate the output. The issue here is that the only component of the model that's conveying information from the input to the output is the value shown in the, the, the value in the hidden node shown by the red box. Meaning you have the entire input being processed and all of that information is expected to be encapsulated within the representation uh, captured by this final node, final hidden node, and that single vector must convey information about everything in the input. Now this becomes challenging. If the input is a short sequence, maybe you can do it. But then think of a dialogue system or a machine translation system where the input is a sequence of 50 words. Expecting that poor vector to carry that much information is kind of unfair to the vector. And it, and in these cases, it won't really do a very good job. Now, if you look at this issue, look at, look at this example over here, 
what we find is that, in fact, every one of these hidden states has some information that explicitly relates to the output. So in this case, for, ex for example, if you look at the uh, output, the word ish in the output relates most to the hidden state corresponding to the word i in the input. The word einen relates uh, over here for ex this one. This guy corresponds most to n. Apfel corresponds most to apple. So to having all of them just read the mushed up information over here loses this specificity. Ideally, we should have a model that conveys the information from the most relevant portions of the input to each step of the output. And this model is clearly not doing it. So how could one try to make sure that the output actually manages to see all components of the input? One way to do it is to say, I'm going to just average all of these hidden responses and use the average hidden response as, uh, as an input to the uh, every step in the decoder. Now, this separates the encoder from the decoder. Previously, we actually had the final hidden state of the encoder being passed to the decoder. Now, that is no longer the case. What we are doing is averaging all of these guys into a single vector, and the decoder is receiving this average in addition to the last word in the sequence. The initial state of the decoder can be a learnable parameter or some fixed vector like 0 or 1. So this red state becomes some other parameter, which could either be fixed or learned. The manner in which information is being passed from the encoder to the decoder is through this vector here, which is the average of the hidden states on the encoder side. And was it clear why we are doing this to you guys? Yes or no? Did I, did I, did I just ask a question, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> okay, so what was the answer to that? Okay, so why are we doing this again? So we are relying too heavily on the one vector at the end of the input, right? And so one of the things that happens as you go through a recurrent, recurrent sequence is that the information keeps getting <coughs> diluted. By the time you get to the last word, through the recurrence, the information about the word I is probably vanishing. And especially as the input gets longer and longer, yeah? Because you have so many words, right? And so, regardless of how you do it, and as you keep increasing the width of the memory with the number of words in the input for a fixed memory size, for a fixed network size, eventually things are going to get diluted, right? And so, uh, the only way you're going to retain information about the entire input is if the hidden representation keeps getting larger with the length of the input, which is not what's happening in the model here. And so, uh, you have this issue that as you pro proceed through the sequence, it keeps getting more and more diluted. And by the time you get to the end, if I have a 50-word sequence, that representation is almost certainly not remembering very much about the first few words in the sequence. And so to sort of work your way around it, you can say the decoder must look at the hidden state explicitly, at the, the hidden state at every input time explicitly. And one way to do it is to just average all of these guys which makes sure that all of them have a contribution to whatever is being passed to the decoder. Does that make sense? Right. Now, what is an issue over here? This is the, the issue here is that when I average up all of these hidden state values, then I'm giving equal weight to every, to the hidden state, state corresponding to every input. So the contribution of the word I is going to be the same as the contribution of the word apple to this hidden state. On the decoder side, whatever is being passed here is not discriminating between the different inputs. So this out here, for instance, must somehow figure out from this mushed up input, the mushed up hidden representation, how much information and what information to extract to make the next prediction. And that becomes challenging, right? So a better thing to do is to somehow 
capture the information, capture the fact that each output actually relates to some portions of the input more than others. For example, the word ish in the output is more related to the word I than to the word apple. And so you would still like to perform this kind of hidden weighted combination of inputs, except that the specific manner in which you, you weight the hidden states before you combine them must be specific to the output. So this way, we would use a different weighted sum of these hidden states going into each of these output steps. The challenge here is what are these weights? And what must the characteristics of these weights be? Now, ideally, these weights must somehow figure out which portions of the input are most relevant to each output. So the overall process is going to be something like this. When you're generating the very first output over here, you're going to com compute some weighted combination of the hidden states in the input and then encode it. And that's my vector C0, which we will call a context. This is the context that's being used to generate the word H. And then once that is done, at the subsequent step, we're going to use a completely different weighted combination of the hidden states in the encoder side. And so these weights are now specific to the second step. So what is changing is the weights. The hidden state values themselves, the H's themselves remain the same. And this forms the context that's going to be passed on when you're generating the second output word. And then the same thing for the third output word, you're going to use yet another weighted combination of the hidden states in the input. And for the fourth, you're going to use yet another, and so on. And this is the process that we will use to generate each word in the output. Now, the, so where does that reflect over here? On the input side, we are generating a hidden state H corresponding to every input word. Now on the output side, when computing any output word, corresponding to that word, there's a very specific set of weights. So to when you're generating the tth word, there's a specific set of weights, W, I of T, and here the T represents the fact that you're generating the tth word on the output side. The subscript I relates to the specific input word that you're considering. So W1 of T is the weight associated to, give, given to H1. W2 of T is the weight given to H2. And the T itself tells you which word you're generating on the output side. Now, how are these weights to be generated and what are the characteristics these weights must have? Again, I point you to the fact that every word in the output relates to a different portion of the input. So the word ish on the output relates most to I. The word apple relates most to apple, right? So ideally, the weights must somehow know which portion of the input to focus on when it's computing this weighted combination of inputs. And so this means that the weights must be dynamically computed, meaning as you're generating the output at each time, you must compute a set of weights such that the weights can be expected to focus on the appropriate portion of the inputs. Now, if these weights are properly, properly computed, then, I, then you must find that when you're generating the word ish, the highest weight is given to H0, which represents the word I. And over here, when you're generating the word Apple, the highest weight must be given to H3, which corresponds to the word Apple. This is the ideal setting, right? Now, how exactly can we compute weights? And what, com what learning mechanism, what computation mechanism can we, can we implement that has a reasonable, a decent chance of learning weights of this kind. For this, we have to consider what information is available to us when we're generating any particular uh, output. So here, for example, when I'm generating the word, the output, the fourth output over here, what, what are the things I've already computed? So if I'm generating 
when I'm generating, uh, computing S3 over here. Before computing S3, what are the things that I have computed that are available to me? Just S2, S0, S1, and S2, right? The latest one is S2. And so the information that we can use to compute the weights for, for the third time step on the decoder side is going to be S2. On the encoder side, we have all of these edges there because the input has already been processed. So if you want to compute the weight of, say, I, that weight must be a function of S2 and H0 because S2 represents all of the latest information on the decoder side. And H0 represents the information corresponding to the word I. Right? So in other words, the weight that we have here for H0, so this would be W0 of 3, right? So that would, that would be W0 of 3. That's going to be a function of S2 and H0. So in general, WI of T is going to be a function of HI, because this is the weight given to the ith input. And ST minus 1, because the, this is the hidden state information available to compute ST. That makes sense to everybody? Right? So, you guys at the back, does that make sense to you? If you don't, I'll ask you. But then we have a second requirement on the weights. You don't want the weights to be arbitrary, because if I had no constraint on the weights, you might have the weights blowing up or vanishing to zero. And so this context vector that we are getting from the input can become unbounded or vanishing. So what we really want is for the weight to compute, we want to compute a weighted average of the inputs, of the hidden states on the input, where the weights focus on the most relevant portions of the input. So one way to achieve this is to say that I require that the weights must be a distribution of some kind. They must all be non-negative, zero or greater, and they must sum to one. So this, become, this makes them a, a probability distribution. And if they are learned properly, then ideally, it must assign the highest weight to the most relevant word on the input, or most relevant words, and lower weights to the others. So simply computing an arbitrary function of this kind is not going to cut it, because an arbitrary function doesn't have the characteristic that the weights across the sequence are all going to be non-negative and sum to one. So, if I, so what kind of mechanism could I use to ensure that they're all non-negative non -negative and sum to one? I can just use a softmax, right? And so the way we will compute the weights is through a two-step process. In the first step, we are going to compute what I will call a raw weight, which is a function between the hidden state at the previous time and the, and the, the state S at the previous time and the hidden, hidden encoder state corresponding to the input that we are trying, whose weight we are trying to compute. And so the raw weight at any time for any input i at any time t is going to be some function of hi and st minus 1. We are placing no restrictions on the function g. It can be absolutely anything. Because we are not requiring g to generate a probability distribution. To convert it to a probability distribution, we're going to put the sequence of soft, sequence of raw weight values through a softmax. And a softmax will immediately convert the set of weights that we've got for each one of these guys to a distribution. So the overall process is, does you have a point? A person called Grey Panther in class. Who's Grey Panther? Grey Panther in class? True. True. Okay, next one. Who's the sixth next person? 
This is Gray Flamingo. Who's Gray Flamingo? Is Gray Fl Flamingo in class? True. Second one's true as also. Thank you. And who is the Olive Lion? The olive line, third one is true. Okay. okay. Uh, does everybody agree that all three are true? So the attention framework computes a different context vector at each output step, which is chosen as the hidden encoder representation corresponding to the highest attention rate. Is the second one true? True? So guys, when I asked you if it was true, why did everybody say yes? Please be awake, right? Uh, and the attention weight for any input word is a function of the hidden encoder representation of the word and the most re recent decoder state. True or false? That's true, right? So this is what we've seen so far, right? We did leave one question. What is the function that computes the raw attention rate? Now this is some function of the hidden state S at the previous time on the output and the hidden encoder state H. But it can be any odd thing. And so there, are, there have been a whole bunch of functions that have been proposed. The most common, the simplest one is to just say, I'm going to try to align the hidden state S over here with the hidden state H over here. So what would this thing really look like? What, what is that? What does that look like? What, what term is that? Assuming all the hidden representations are length one, what would it represent? Mm -hmm. Scale? Let's say dot product, so what is that? Anyone? It's just a cosine similarity, is it not? H dot S. So you're just saying I'm going to pay attention to whatever is most similar over to the past. I'm not sure if that intuitively that makes sense, but that's really what you're doing, right? Now, this second one, what is that over here? Anybody? What is the second function? And when would we use it? Anyone? So when the hidden states and the encoder and decoder are different sizes, then you want to project the one to the same size as the other. And then subsequently, <laughs> you're still looking at a uh, cosine similarity, right? And so, uh, and then of course, for this, this projection matrix can be a learned matrix. And there have been other uglier functions that have been proposed. But the first two guys, they're the most commonly used ones, right? So for the rest of my example, I'm, just, I'm going to consider this one. I'm going to say that there's some hidden state vector on the encoder side. There's a hidden state S that we are computing on the decoder side. They are not necessarily the same size. And we're going to uh, have estimate a matrix that projects the one to the same dimensionality to the, as the other, and then we compute it, and in a product. Okay. So given this, Let's go through an example of how a typical inference process works. You'd be given an input, say I ate an apple. This is going to be processed by your recurrent neural network in this case, and it's going to generate a hidden state corresponding to every single input. So, and then you have to go move to the encoder decoder side. The decoder side, it's again a recurrent model, so there's an initial state which can be either some fixed value like a vector of all zeros or a vector of all ones or, or the average of all of the H's or something learned. There are all different possibilities. And uh, then <clears throat> at the very first time, to generate the very first word, you're going to be passing in the start of sequence marker out here. And this S minus one is the decoder hidden state that we have got. So we're going to first compute this matrix in a product of S minus one with each of these H's to, to obtain the 
raw uh, attention weight for every one of the encoder states. And then once we've obtained that, we obtained the, raw, the uh, uh, raw attention weight for all of these guys, given by this E, we can put all of them through a softmax, and that's going to give you an attention weight for every one of the encoder states. And subsequently, once we've got all of these weights, we can compute the context, ve context vector, which is just a weighted sum of the hidden representation on the encoder state. So this context vector is now going to be fed to the uh, recurrent computation on the decoder side. And what will this generate? What is the output going to be over here? Anyone? What will the output at that step be? Is it going to be a word? What will it be? Is it going to be a weight matrix? What what will it be? <coughs> Again, the decoder, as we said in the last class, what is the decoder? Yeah? Yes, go ahead. What was that again? It is a language model, right? And what kind of language model is it? It's a conditional language model. What does it compute at each time? A word? A computes a probability distribution over all the words, right? Remember? And so at this time, it's going to actually compute a probability distribution over all the words. And then what would you do at this point? You can do an argmax, or you can draw. You can have some mechanism for drawing a word from this probability distribution, right? And so, once you've drawn a word from this distribution, whatever it is, let's say it's the word ish, then at the next time, that word ish is going to go back in to compute the next word. But at this time, we now have the hidden state as zero, right? So the hidden state S0 is going to be used along with each one of these hidden states to compute the raw attention weights for all of the encoder hidden states. And then these raw attention weights are going to be put through a softmax to get you the actual weights for every one of the encoder hidden states. And then we use these weights to compute the context vector, which is the weighted sum of the encoder hidden states. Now C1, this context vector C1 is going to be different from C0 because the weights are different. And that C1 now goes in here, along with the word H that was drawn at the previous time. And the result is going to be yet another. It's going to be a probability distribution for the next word, right? So when I look at this, what is the actual probability term being computed over here? What is the probability term being, what does this probability distribution actually represent? Anyone? So, the, there's no chalk there? Yeah, there's a chalk right here, okay. So, this guy here, the, those y's, what are, what are those y's? What probability is it? Probability of which? Translated word. It's going to be probability of W2, right? Given what? Given W1 equals H, W0 equals start of sequence, W1 equals H, right? And what else? And S, and given S0. No, this is actually I ate an apple, right? That's what it's actually computed at each time. This is still very much a recurrent model, right? And what do recurrent models compute? The probability distribution at the current time given all the inputs until now, <coughs> which includes the inputs on the input side and all the outputs generated so far. Make sense to everybody? Right, okay. And so from this distribution, you're going to be drawing some word, like harbor. And 
Now, power goes back in, right? What would we do at the next step? Anyone? For the next output, what would we do? The same thing. So what is the same thing? <laughs> that plus W2, I guess. So what would the next step be, guys? Yeah, but what is the process? We are going to use, and what would we use for that? S1. We are going to use S1 to compute the raw weights for all of the hidden states on the encoder side. Use those to compute, the, uh, to put them through a softmax to compute an attention weight for every encoder state on the hidden side. Then compute a weighted sum of all the encoder states. And that's going to give you the next context vector which is C2, which is fed in here along with Harvard to generate a probability distribution. And what is that probability distribution now? And this is W2 equals Harvard, right? And the rest of it. So at each time you're computing the probability distribution for the next word, given everything so far and everything in the input. So this is the key piece. In other words, we are always performing, what are we performing? This is language modeling, right? And we are always computing conditional probabilities for a language model. Does that make sense to everybody, right? And so I could draw a word from this and keep continuing to do this until I eventually draw an end of sequence model. Is everyone clear? Now, so what is this model actually computing overall? What is this model representing? What kind of a model is this? Yeah, but what kind of a model is this still? It's a, yes. It's a conditional language model. It's always a conditional language model, right? Any time you do this, it is a conditional language model over here. And what kind of conditional language model is it? What is it a, what is it a model over? Is it a model over individual words? Yeah. What is it a model over? Sequences. What kind of sequences? What does it begin with? It, it is going to be the probability, the distribution for all sequences that look like SOS, EOS, right? Mm -hmm. This is not specified. Given, given what? This is S in the SRS to the input, right? I zero to I n US, right? So it is a conditional language model with probability distribution. It's a probability distribution over sequences compute conditioned on whatever has been input. A regular language model is an unconditional language model. It just learns the probability distribution of all sequences in the language. But when we put up, when we learn a sequence to sequence model, what are we learning? Conditional, a conditional language model, right? So yes. Uh, is the input of the uh, encoder encoded in the, the part of the, in the part of the probability? Over here, so the encoder side is on this side. That's the magic, right? The encoder side is on the conditioning side. And the decoder side is on the conditioned side. Yeah. So that's the distinction between the encoder and the decoder. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, they are on two sides of the conditioning. Okay, so given this, if I wanted to choose a particular sequence, which sequence would I choose? If I'm performing inference, the model is actually modeling the probability distribution for all word sequences in the language, conditioned on the input, right? Which one would you choose? The most likely one. And so what is the actual inference we are performing? So, okay, but before I get to that, actually I'll skip to this, right? What, we are actually performing this. We want to find the word sequence that has the highest 
probability, right? And so uh, this is, and it's a non-trivial problem, just as we saw in the last class, because the model is not looking at all of the uh, word sequences in the language simultaneously, right? So one way to think about this is, where did I put my chart? These things walk, so it's not fair, anyway. <laughs> and is there an eraser over here? <coughs> All right, I use another word, okay. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> So here's what we are looking at, right? I want you to think about this. If you want to, perf if what we are performing here is maximum a posteriori classification. In any kind of classification problem, what is it we really want to do? I'm going to have some set of classes which can be continuous or if it's a regression, it can be discrete or if it's a regression, it's continuous. But you want to model p of y given x where x is the input, and this is the output to be predicted. And the more accurately you model this, the better your predictions are going to be. And then eventually, you're going to perform argmax modeling, right, at each time. And so for, in, order for, in order for us to be able to do this, we need to know p of y given x. But for which y's do we need to know this? And we need to know this for every possible y, right? And so what we really need is, I have y, I have to find the p of y given x for every possible y, and then pick the y for which is the highest, right? In your standard MLP, what do we do? you have a probability distribution over all classes, correct? And so you're actually seeing the probability for every y for the given x, which is why you can pick the most probable word. If I want to do that in the case of sentences, what happens? You, the problem is this, that this thing is infinitely long, right? There are infinite classes. If you wanted to explicitly model this, you'd need an output layer with infinite classes. You're not going to be doing that, right? So instead, what we are doing is computing the probability. What we can do is to compute the probability of just one word at a time. So anytime I feed in, I draw a specific word. So what I really want to do is model the entire distribution and pick the y for which this is largest. What, is this computing the entire distribution? Is it? Yes or no? Yes. Can everybody say no together? No. Why not? Because it's not, it ends when you draw the us. No, it's because there's only a single sequence sentence being considered. How many sentences is it considering in this case? One, a Shaba and an Apple Gagas, right? You really want to compute this distribution for every word sequence. Instead, you're computing it for one word, right? And somehow you want to come up with a mechanism which picks that one guy magically so that it's the most likely. Are you going to be able to do that? Impossible, right? You have an infinite spread and anything you do is going to be kind of uh, suboptimal, right? So what would be a better way of doing this? Yeah. Every uh, output of the decoder computes a single word. Yeah, you're, you're drawing a single word from the distribution. But what's sent in at S1 to S2, is that, that, is that, does that represent that single word or does it represent the probability all of the words. No, look over here. So what goes in here? I've literally shown you what goes in here. What goes in here? Uh, it's a word. Okay. So how do we tackle the problem? Because la in last class we went through that 
who knows might have a higher probability. Yeah, so the whole point, so that's exactly it, right? When, so the greedy approach of picking one word at a time can give you the mistake that, you know, we are picking one point and we are generating a sentence and we are doing, a, we are doing the best we can to try to make sure that this guy is as close to this okay. position as possible. But you really cannot, right? This is the greedy approach. That is the greedy approach, right? So what is a better way of doing this? A better way of doing this is to say, so think about it, right? Uh, this is, you, think of, you can think of this as a landscape, right? And suppose I let you walk through a pinhole, and the pinhole is only one word wide. So you can be looking at the world, you know, what is the highest spot in this room? But then I'm looking through this, this is all I can see, right? And then I can sort of scan through this, and say, aha, that's the highest word. That's literally what we are doing when we are picking one word at a time. This hole that we are peeking through is one word wide, right? What would be a better way of improving our chances of success? You make this hole a little bit wider, right? And so now I'm going to see a little bit more than just the words. And maybe I have a better chance of finding the highest peak in the landscape. So that's basically your standard beam search. That's what beam search is really doing. This is your beam, right? And so... That's what we can do, right? At each point, the simplest thing is, now the ideal thing is that to explore the entire landscape. The ideal thing is to say, you know, look at the height at every point and pick the highest one, which means that I have to compute the probability distribution for every single word sequence. But for that, I could start off with the first word given a start of sequence marker, then pass all of the words back into the second stage of the network. Then I'm going to get, get probabilities for all the words, pass all of those again uh, to the third stage and so on. And that's not going to work. So in a beam search, you say I'm going to retain you know, the top K, which is like saying I'm going to make my people from one word wide to say five words wide, right? And so you pick the, pick the top K. And the thing over here is that when you pick the top K in an, from an engineering perspective, as you, uh, uh, you know, when you increase the beam, each one of these guys in this step, both of them have the same previous as zero, so the context vector is going to be the same. But then if I go to the next time step, observe that this, when I'm making the prediction here, I'm computing the context vector using this version of the hidden state, right? Out here, I'm going to be using this version of the hidden state. And so the actual context vectors that, are go that go in are going to be different in the two cases, right? And so even the set of weights, as you increase the beam, every entry in the beam is going to have a different mechanism for, com you know, for computing the attention weights and the context vectors are going to be different. But besides that, this is exactly the same beam search that we saw in the last class. And uh, we're going to continue doing this till we get a uh, end of sequence marker where the entire sequence is, has the highest probability S. Uh, previously, weren't, weren't the output probabilities corresponding to, like we only generate output probabilities for the output sequence? So over here... It's just the same. I've just drawn the picture differently, right? At each point, you're going to get a probability vector. You'll be picking the most likely sequence. It's always the most likely sequence. So look at this. Uh, the, uh, you're picking the top K of the product of the probabilities of the entire word in the sequence. Anti-sequence approach. So you're always picking the top K based on the prob probability of the entire sequence rather than the latest word in the sequence. So this is exactly what we had before. It, all that has changed is the manner in which we are computing the probability distributions. But like if the target output sequence is P nodes, then for the first word, we wouldn't have a the probability. So the you do, no, this is, this is inference. You don't know what the target output is. Right? So during inference, at each time, you're going to keep expanding and you're keeping the top high. Okay, right? I have not mentioned training. I'm speaking of how you can use this model for inference. So for, for inference, we can generate a probability for any word in the context. 
Uh, because it's going to be generating a probability distribution for the entire word sequence, right? So this figure is probably uh, not capturing it fully. But if I were to look at what, is hap what happens, I'd have the encoder. And so I'll, I'll let me just call this the encoder, which has all the hidden states. And from this, I get a context vector and the start of sequence marker. And it's actually going to compute a probability distribution for all the words in the sequence, right? At the very first start. So let's say I decide to keep the top two. So then I'm going to knock these guys out. And these are the two most probable words in the sequence. You with me? OK, then at uh, the next time, I'm going to have another copy, two copies <coughs> of the uh, recurrence tree. And this one is, let's say, this is the word ish. This is the word, you know, do, for instance. This is going to take the word ish going in. This is going to take the word do going in. And then this hidden state is going to be used al along with the encoder to generate a context vector which goes into both places, right? And then at this point, each of these guys is going to generate a probability distribution over all the words. So every one of these entries now has a probability which is going to be, so this, is, let's say this one corresponds to this. So the probability associated with this is the probability that you have computed from the network here times the probability over here. That's going to give you the probability of the entire sequence. And then you pick the top two based on the sequence level probability. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we we'll actually need to update in the uh, encoder for uh, according to the... The encoder is we have only computed once, right? The only the context changes. Uh, yeah, the context, every time we need to include the previous state. Yeah. For each word. Yeah. Okay. For each state, correct. Right, because the context is going to change right. based on the previous state. So over here, you have only one context vector. Both of them will use the same context vector, right? But at the next time, if you know, whatever goes out here, the, this branch is going to use the context vector computer from this one, and this branch is going to use the context vector computer from this one. Yeah, okay. And you continue this till the end of sequence marker has actually been encountered as the most likely state. There was one slide that I skipped in the middle. I'll get back to it, right? So, yeah. Uh, for multiple beams, like uh, when we're computing the two most likely sequences, does it terminate when either reaches EOS or? No, when the most likely sequence is, so let's say, where did I keep my chalk? <laughs> hmm? It hides from me, it's bad, right? And so let's say I've got, and at some point this has, this has a, uh, I have computed a probability sequence. The probability, the probability distribution for, for both entries in the beam, right? And so here, let's just assume that if EOS is not the highest, most probable, then you're not even going to consider it, right? But now if I may keep two, and let's say this is the word whatever Z, and this is the word EOS, if this remains in the beam, you're going to compute the total probability through this chain. If this remains in the beam, you're going to compute the total probability through this chain. If Z, if this chain has a higher probability than this guy, then you're not going to terminate this, right? Mm -hmm. All you know is that you cannot extend this any further. So now the next time, you're going to have two things coming out of here because the above one cannot be extended. But you're going to keep extending things till the word sequence that ends with the end of sequence marker has the highest probability. Now this has this characteristic that when I get here, I may get two things, and I might find that the total probability of this chain of both of these are lower than the total probability of this guy. Then I'll have to pick the one that was the, one, the uh, EOS, the, the sequence that terminated in the EOS earlier, right? So anyway, questions, guys? Any questions, yes? I just want to mention this PC, but doesn't it necessarily bias it towards? It does, right? We have the same issue, so you, go, you, you end up with heuristics. Uh, so at the end, at the end of the day, we are, get, we are getting the uh, the vector, the sentence with the highest probability. 
you are best guess for the sentence with the highest probability because you're still looking for a small window, right? But the, at, at the end of the whole process. At the end of the process, if you're looking through a beam of two, does this guarantee that you're going to find the most likely peak? Yeah. Yes? No, no I, yeah. Right, you, you, are, you, you are more likely than if you have a narrower beam, that's all. The wider the beam, the more likely you are to find the best guy, that's all, right? So now, what does this actually learn, right? So if you look at, does this model really work? Well, one way to look at, to determine if the model is really working is to look at the attention weights that have been learned. So when you're generating the word ish over here, uh, what would you want the attention weight to focus on? You want, when you're generating ish, you want the greatest attention word to be, weight to be given to? Eight zero, right? For harbor, what would you want the more greatest attention weight? Right. right, harbor is, you know, eight became harbor gegesen, right? So both harbor and gegesen must focus on eight. You know, einen is an, it must focus, the highest attention weight must be given to an, right? Does it really work this way? So one way to, we can actually visualize the attention weights. And in fact, uh, uh, this uh, example from Bahadana's original paper may have what, maybe what actually sold this model to everybody. And so here, this is a machine translation problem. They're translating from English, which is given on top, to French. The uh, sentence is the agreement on the economic European, European economic area was signed in August 1992 period, right? The corresponding French translation is la corde sur la zone économique européenne, uh, you know, so you can see that, right? And so there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between the words, so you can actually see that the, word, uh, that the attention map is diagonal. <coughs> so when it, was gen when it was translating the word le, uh, and when it was generating the word le, it was focusing most on the word the because there's a direct correspondence. Then similarly, agreement, the translation is accord, and then if you look at the attention weight, you can see that when it's generating the word accord, it's focusing most on agreement. And on the sur la, and so once again, you can see that in each case, it's focusing on the right words on the input. The interesting bit is when you look at the European economic area. In French, the word order is changed it becomes zone economic European, right? Mm -hmm. And so when it's generating zone, it's actually focusing on zone. When it's generating European, it's generating focusing on European. And when it's gen generating economic, <coughs> it's generating on focusing on economic. And so you can see that the attention weights, they go from being diagonal to actually following the inverse diagonal, which gives you the correct you know, attention for each of these words, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually doing a pretty impressive job. And uh, we have some more interesting examples over here. This one was uh, the man said something here, right? <coughs> I noticed something. The least known of environments. Oh, my French is so horrible that I can't find out. But if there's any person who knows French in class, you can verify that these attention maps actually make sense, right? So, amazing. Now, they have some translation examples in the paper, which is, uh, again, translation from English to French. I won't pretend that I understand it, but apparently it's very good. Now, the thing is, before these models came in, the uh, translation models, Google Translate used to use various other older style models for machine translation, language translation, and Google Translate stank. So this model came out in 2016. They literally switched to this uh, attention-based model overnight in, about, in October or November 2016. And Google Translate went, it literally went from being completely useless to perfectly useful overnight <coughs> because they switched the model. No. Amazing. The things are much better now, of course, but uh, that was a phenomenal feature. So we've seen how a trained network can be used to compute outputs, right? How to compute one sequence to the other. 
Now, before doing that, I want to go back and point out one more thing that I kind of skipped over. And that's here. So I just said earlier that we can just use the hidden state on the decoder side against the hidden state on the encoder side to compute attention rates. But then that may be too fine-grained. For example, when you're translating the word apple, right? Which portion of the input should you be focusing on? To determine, determine which portion of the input you should be focusing on, the context you have is I ate am, right? So when I'm looking at I ate an, you really know that you must be focusing on something that's related to food, not necessarily an apple, right? And so that means the hidden representation over here is very specific. It literally says the word apple. You want to have a lower granularity representation to determine that this is what must be focused on. If you directly try to focus on the word apple, you're likely to get confused. What you really want to know is that this is some kind of a food element that can be eaten, right? And so over here, you don't really want to be using the hidden representation for apple directly for determining the weight. You want to project it down to something that's coarser to decide that this is what is important and this is what I must be paying attention to when I translate the next word. Does that make sense? And so what we typically do is project this hidden representation into two different values. One is what we call the key. The key is a, is a coarser representation that represents category level information. And the value is a finer representation that actually represents specific instance level information. And so when you're computing the attention weights, we actually will use the key, but then the attention weights are going to be applied to the value to compute the context. Does that make sense to you guys? Right. And so this is just a minor tweak where instead of directly using the hidden state over here against the hidden state over here from the hidden state, you're going to have a lower dimensional representation called a query, which is more at a concept level. And on the input, you're going to have a lower dimensional representation called the key. And these are the ones that are actually used to uh, it's not necessarily lower dimensional, but it's lower rank. And these are the ones that are, good, that are actually used to determine the attention weights because to decide what to pay attention to, you don't need very detailed information, right? And then subsequently, these attention weights are applied to the value to compute the context. Anyway, going on, questions? Good morning, Chad. Yeah. Really? It's just a linear projection. So you have the hidden state, and it's a projection. It's a down projection, typically through some, some kind of a uh, weight matrix that is learned. OK, now let's go at, and let's look at how it is trained. This is exactly what we had in the previous, discussed in the previous class, right? Now, in the ideal setting, we would be uh, having something of this kind where the input goes in. You have the box, the output comes out, the target output comes out, and you would compute the divergence, and then you would propagate this derivative of this divergence back to learn all components of both the encoder and decoder. But this would not work. Why? Again, why would this not work? Yeah. Like many, many sequences into absolutely clean divergence. So the point is that during the uh, uh, early stages of training, at least, there's no guarantee on what kind of output is going to be generated. You don't know how long it is going to be. Uh, you know, initially the model is noise. It could just it could just generate a sequence of thes. You're going to find this happening in your homework. And then how do you compare the 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 the, the, the to I ate an apple? You really cannot, right? And so uh, Finding, div computing divergences is going to be impossible, and, the, and whatever you compute is not going to be differentiable. So what we will do is to guide the decoder, and the way we guide the decoder is that we're also going to be passing the target into the decoder. But this is only during training, right? This is what we call teacher forcing. And so during training, you're actually going to be passing an Ichaba and an Apfel-Gegesen, so that at each time it's only 
the problem is down to predicting just a single word, just as we did in, in standard language modeling. And now you can compute the divergence for one word and then propagate it back, right? So now this has a problem in that at this point, it's like you know, learning to ride a bicycle. If nobody ever lets you go on your own and someone's always supporting you, you're never really going to learn to ride a bicycle. Every now and then you must fall. And so, uh, I'm going to skip some of this because it's basically saying exactly what I said. So one of, one of the tricks that we will do is that every now and then, we will actually draw a word <coughs> from the output distribution. Instead of always feeding in the actual <coughs> target word at each time, as the model keeps getting better, you're actually, you're actually going to generate words from the output distribution and pass that back in. And when you generate words from the output distribution, sometimes it's going to be wrong. And you're teaching the model to sort of still get the correct outputs, even when the generated word is wrong. So uh, the, uh, I sort of encourage you to go through the slides over here a bit. What we're actually explaining is that the whole thing is actually maximum likelihood estimation. But I will, I will skip that because uh, we need to move on, right? So any questions so far? Any questions on the basic model and how it works? Is everything absolutely clear? Crystal clear. Hmm? Crystal clear. Crystal clear. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think you understand what the part where you're considering like you're trying to compute like the different um, context weights when you have to like the input in order to determine or tell the model like which word you would consider. That seemed like it was only possible when you're doing two computations. Yeah. No, you're not, right? So here's the thing. Regardless. I hate it. Hmm? Oh, thank you. The problem is white on white. Right. So let's say I just have I eat an apple, right? Yes. Then at this point, Let's say I, I give you a startup sequence and some initial state. I'm going to use this initial state to compute all of these attention weights. Mm -hmm. It might have made a mistake, right? And maybe let's say I just computed something and whatever what I got here was wrong. At this point, this hidden state is making no reference to the ground truth, right? And so now this whatever hidden state was used was computed here was then used to compute the next set of attention weights. But even if the word I, if I got a completely wrong sequence of words over here, the same process still holds, right? It's going to get increasingly wrong if your output is increasingly wrong. But if your model is good enough, it won't. Okay. Yeah. So the teacher forcing during training is just making sure that the model doesn't wander off into bad places. In the first place, without teacher forcing, you cannot even compute a reasonable divergence. Right? So there are various like, extensions to this. On the input side, uh, so on the KTV example, why do we focus on all the food items? Uh, so uh, the point is, you would also equally be focusing on all apples, right? There's no difference between, but the, the amount of attention to be weighted, uh, to be paid, depends on the fact that it's a food item. So if I'm looking at I ate an, we really have no information about whether I should be translating apple or orange. As far as you're concerned, they're both the same thing. And so you want to sort of look at the fact that it's a it's a food item, right? Yes. And so. Well, it's 
So the so so the detailed information tends to be in the value, and the cruder information tends to be in the key. That's it. Right, the more information you have, the better. Yeah. So one simple extension that we have over here is something called multi-head attention, where instead of just attend, computing one set of keys and one set of one set of values, you might have multiple sets of keys and multiple sets of values. So for example, what to pay attention to might be considered from the point of view as a part of speech. On the other hand, it might also be considered as from the perspective of uh, you know, semantic concepts, right? So depending on, there are different mechanisms to decide what to, what to pay attention to. So one unsupervised way of trying to capture all of this is to have multiple sets of keys and multiple sets of values be computed from the hidden state. And correspondingly, you'd have multiple sets of queries. And so from each key, Query key value combination, you're going to get one context vector. At each time, so you'd end up with multiple context vectors, which would be concatenated for the decoding, right? So this is just a simple extension. But then, anyway, here's the second problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, here. Yeah. So once again, so let's just say and an orange, right? For instance, then over here, the fact that you are going to be paying attention to something is going to be dependent on, again, keep in mind that the word order is a secondary aspect, right? The specific word order could be something else. But both of these are equally important in this particular context. So what do you, what do you actually want to pay attention to? So alternately, alternately stated, suppose I were translating two different sentences. One was I, Ate an orange, and the other is I ate an apple. So out on the decoder side, I have translated the I ate an portion. Then for the next word, should the fact that this is an apple give me make it more important than the fact that this is an orange? As far as the translation is concerned, these two are the same, right? The only thing is that both of them are crude. So uh, to, in order to compute the attention weights, the category level information becomes more relevant than the specific value itself. But then once you figure out what to pay, atten to, pay attention to, you want to take into consideration the fact that it's an apple and not an orange. That's where the key and the value come in. Does that un answer the question? So for each key, you might have multiple uh, pairs of values. Right? So, so corresponding to each key, there would be one value and one query. Okay. If you had multiple heads, each head would come with its own key query, uh, key value query set. Right? So all right, uh, answers for the first one. What is the answer, guys? Full research. research. The lady sleeping over there. What's the answer to the second one? So, okay. The second and third are right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Multi head attention computes a separate set of keys and values for each head at each input, and it computes a separate query for each head on the decoder side, right? Uh, there were a bunch of very nice. Uh, examples, we saw some examples with machine translation, you can actually use the same thing. The nice thing with the encoder decoder setup is that you can do this for all kinds of things like, uh, you know, captioning images. So the, here in the encoder was actually a CNN working over images and the decoder was generating captions 
and they show how the same model can be used to, uh, you know, used for captioning. And if you look at in the first picture, let's say the caption at the gate uh, inferred was a woman is throwing a frisbee in the park. But then when you look at what it's paying attention to, when it says frisbee, it's the portion of the frisbee, right? Or the last one is uh, most interesting. A giraffe standing in a forest with trees in the background. If you look at what it's paying attention to, it's paying attention to everything but the giraffe. Very nice, you know, very, very nice. So uh, we've looked at various forms of sequence to sequence models, which are generalizations of recurrent neural networks. Uh, and so for more details, there are lots of papers, posts on Piazza. This is going to appear in homework four. They're going to be speech, doing speech recognition with attention models. But then just to move on, a brief uh, peer into what's going to happen next week. The input sequence over here feeds into a recurrent structure, right? And it's terminated by an explicit end of sequence marker. And in the uh, basic, uh, the uh, what I call the simple translation model, all of the information was being stored in the hidden state corresponding to the end of sequence marking. In the attention model, instead, we considered the hidden states at every time, and we automatically computed a weight sum of the hidden state values. And why did we do this? We, see, we said that when you, in the simple case, the recurrence is going to dilute information as you go through time. And you didn't want that dilution to happen, right? But when I look at this guy, what is happening over here? Does the representation for apple get influenced by the representation of i? By i? Because there is recurrence, right? So what happened over here is that every word over here ends up with a representation which is actually influenced by everything that happened in the past or on both sides, if you're using a bi-directional network, right? Do you really want it to be influenced by everything? That would only make sense if we were trying to learn a combined representation for the entire input, right? But in our attention-based model, our model is explicitly figuring out what to pay attention to. So that means that this recurrent buildup of representation doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Should not be necessary. And so maybe we don't really need these guys. That makes sense? Right? So I could just do that. But would that work? Would that would that work? Uh, Pardon me? Order is missing, but there's something else, right? In this case of exam, in the case of language, a word is often can often be both an adjective and a noun, or it can be a verb and a noun and a, or, or a noun or an adjective, right? So the actual representation that you must that you must learn for a word must depend on its usage in its context, right? That information is getting lost. That's something that the recurrent model was capturing. But the problem was that the recurrent model was capturing it in a very rigid sort of way, sequentially left to right, which didn't make a lot of sense, right? So the recurrence makes no sense. On the other hand, completely ignoring the context makes no sense either. So given that completely ignoring the context makes no sense, how can we fix this? So cosine similarity, right? We can go right back to the attention framework. And so, this eliminates context specificity. Now, uh, you know, for example, in our in, in our uh, example over here, the embedding for an, the representation for an, must depend on the remaining words because an can be translated to ein, einus, einer, depending on uh, what else is happening in the in the language, right? So we're going to use the attention framework itself to reintroduce context specificity. So now the encoder is going to be composed without recurrence, but to make sure that the representations of, that we learn for each word are actually consider all the information in the input, we are going to use the attention framework to get context-specific representations. And the way we do it 
is that I have all of my, uh, I could just compute my initial embeddings, pass it through some kind of a network to get an initial representation. But then I can use the same query key value framework to compute a query, a key, and a value from every one of these words. And then to update the, I, I would update the representations for every word based on everything else in the input. And to update the representation for the word I, I'm going to use the query for the word I against the keys for all the words in the input, including itself, to compute a set of attention weights. And then once I've computed a set of attention weights, these attention weights will be applied with the values that I've got for all the words to compute the updated representation for the, for the word I. And, so, and then I can use the same mechanism subsequently for, so this is the updated representation is simply going to be a weighted sum of the values, right? And then I can use the same representation subsequently to uh, get an updated representation for the word eight, where I'm, use, I'm going to use the query for eight against the keys for all the words to get attention weights, and then use the, these attention weights along with the values of all the words to get the updated representation for eight, and so on, for every one of these inputs. This whole thing is what I will call a self-attention block. And subsequently, you know, so this is, this is what is called a single head self-attention block. But then we can still use the same <coughs> concept that we had before, right? That you can have multiple heads to pay, uh, to pay attention to different aspects of the input. So I can have many copies of the self-attention block, each of them copying its, uh, computing its own query key and value combination. And the uh, manner in which it's computed, of course, is, you know, the query key and value are all computed using matrix transformation of the hidden representation. So every one of these would compute a uh, an updated value for the input, and the updated values computed by all, for, by all of the heads would be concatenated into a new representation. Now, just for engineering sake, often this is passed through another NLP to mix things up. And this entire thing is what we call a multi-head self-attention block. And so on the input side, you can have any number of these guys to uh, you know, stacked on one on top of the other to generate the updated representation. But this is done without records, right? Uh, yeah. Do we need to include the, the predicted, predicted words for, uh, into the uh, attention block for every, every time? So there's no prediction over here. This is the input side, right? So this is the input side, right? This is the encoder. Yeah, okay. And then uh, very often, now, now the point is, if I just look at the encoder just without, uh, uh, you know, naively in this manner, then you have this issue that you're, forget, you're getting, losing track of their position. So permuting the words will not change the representations that you learn, which doesn't make sense. So you like to ensure that the positional information is also captured. And the positional information is captured through something called position embeddings. So position vectors, which are, are a sequence of vectors which have the characteristic that if I look at the vector, I know exactly which position it is. But the position vectors, which are the, the, the relationship between two position vectors, some distance, distance apart is fixed. So you have this characteristic that every position vector encodes a unique position, but then the relationship between position vectors depends only on the distance between them. So P of T plus tau. It's an M of tau times P T. And so, and there's a very specific format for position vectors that's presented in the original paper. And these things would then be concatenated to the embeddings at the input before the rest of the network is processed, right? So this is on the encoder side. We can use the same thing also on the decoder side with one minor difference in that any time you're making any kind of a prediction on the decoder side, right, this was the encoder. When I'm learning the updated representation for ST, say, I have the representations for all the words in the input. But on the decoder side, you're generating words one word at a time. Because remember, this is a language model. You're going left to right. You're still computing the probability for the next word given all the words in the past and the entire input which means that on the decoder side, you will not have the future words. So this, this gives us this framework where 
uh, which may, which adds some inter in some engineering uh, issues, which we will talk about in the next class that we'll also be dealing with when we over possibly if we have it. Right? And so anyway, I'll stop right here. Just a just a brief. Uh, I'll skip the polls, but we're going to have more on transformers next week. I won't be here next week because I'm traveling, but uh, our wonderful TAs, Josh and Kate, will be covering transformers in all their ugly aspects, including the details. They'll also show you how to code them up. On Wednesday, we have a guest lecture by Roshan Sharma from Google, who's going to be talking about large language models. I don't know whether he's allowed to talk about Gemini, but uh, <laughs> he will definitely, he's an expert on LLMs, and especially as applied to speech, and he'll tell us all about it.